The first scripture lesson we heard today came from the Gospel of John. It was an extended prayer that Christ offered. And so as we prepare for the second scripture lesson from the book of Acts, let us hear again some of those words from Jesus' prayer. Let us pray. Loving God, draw near to us. Protect us by your Spirit, that we may be one as you and Christ through the Holy Spirit are one. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For, Lord, you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The book of Acts has chapter 1 divided into a couple key events. It has Jesus appearing as the risen Christ, teaching and instructing his disciples before then ascending into heaven. And then comes an event in the life of the early church where they decide to name a new disciple to fulfill the role previously held by Judas. Listen to this reading from Acts chapter 1, verses 15 to 17 and 21 to 26. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers, and together the crowd numbered about 120 persons. And Peter said, Friends, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit through David foretold, concerning Judas, who became a guide for those who arrested Jesus. Judas was numbered among us and was allotted his share of this ministry. But now, one of the people who has accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and was among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when Christ was taken up from us, one of these must now become a witness with us to Christ's resurrection. And so the group proposed two, Joseph, called Barsabbas, also known as Justus, and Matthias. And then the group prayed and said, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which one of these two you have chosen to take place in this ministry and to take the apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them. And the lot fell on Matthias, and he was added to the eleven apostles. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So how do you decide who belongs to your group of friends? You're thinking of inviting some people over for a meal at your house. So how do you choose who gets to come? Well, there are logistics to consider, such as how many people will fit around your table. And there are social rules to consider, such as, well, which people might enjoy each other's company. When my parents were newly married, they met five other young couples who lived all on the same street, all of them starting families. And so those six couples actually formed a supper club that ended up meeting for over 30 years. And even though their lives went in different directions and many of them relocated throughout the city, they stayed in touch and met regularly for decades. Now some of you are part of similar groups social gatherings, book clubs, Bible studies, sororities, you know it is a very big question if you're asked to consider who might we add to our core group of friends. The followers of Jesus faced this question not long after Christ himself had been ascended into heaven. Out of the larger group who were his followers, Jesus early on had named 12 to be a core group of disciples. But it was Judas's betrayal and subsequent death by suicide that decreased their number to 11. And 11 just never felt right. It always felt incomplete. And so the followers decided that a new 12th disciple should be named. It's almost as if they'd received an engraved invitation from God addressed to them as a group saying, to the eleven disciples, plus one. Plus ones are actually a relatively new social concept. In the past, 
you would send out invitations to weddings and social events, largely to just two groups of people, to married people and to single people. But now with so many people not necessarily falling into one or either category, the practice has developed to allow an invited friend to bring a guest, to bring a plus one. And that way the invitee can decide, well, who might accompany them to the event? The invitee can then shape who they would like to have around and also who might fit in well at this gathering. Well, for the followers of Jesus, including those 11 core disciples, they now face the situation of having to name a plus one. So Peter on that day took the lead. He stood before the group and he began naming criteria for choosing this new disciple. Peter said, well, it should be someone who's been a follower of Jesus from the very beginning, who was there when Jesus was baptized by John, who saw the trial, who witnessed the good news of the resurrection, and was there when Christ ascended. It was important that this disciple be someone who truly knew Jesus who saw him, who heard him speak, who watched him heal, who witnessed the terrible trial and crucifixion, and who firsthand experienced the joyful resurrection. In the end, two candidates were put forth for consideration, Joseph Barsabbas and Matthias. But how do you choose between them? And this is where the whole story gets a little unusual. For this big decision, for this naming of the twelfth disciple of Jesus Christ, the disciples cast lots, and they ended up choosing Matthias. Now, we don't know exactly how this happened. It might have involved a marked stone that was rolled around in a cup, and then the first stone that came out identified the person chosen. They might have literally rolled dice. But overall, it feels kind of arbitrary for such an important decision. Why we good Presbyterians, we form committees. We literally meet over a period of weeks to consider, well, who might be nominated to serve as deacons and elders for this congregation? Our goal in meeting is to prepare a diverse slate of candidates, people that are of different gender identities and different gifts and ethnicities, people of varying lengths of church membership. In our nominating committee work, we would never simply pull a name out of a hat or roll a pair of dice. In the same way, by comparison, think of how companies today look for new employees. They also are diligent in the search process. They might use an online recruiting tool like ZipRecruiter or Monster.com or LinkedIn. That lets them thoughtfully weed out candidates without the skills needed and hone in on the people who are the best quality candidates. But as we know, business approaches are not always the best way to find disciples of Christ. If a business uses an online job application, automatically they are weeding out candidates that might not have access to a computer or email. There are often times that an application comes in and depending on what the name is at the top or how the name is spelled, some business people will lift up an application as something to be considered and other applications they may choose to simply set by the side without reading it. When an application form has many lines to list all your academic studies, it's basically ignoring the economic inequities in America that keep some people from having a full and rich educational background. And if we're on this topic and we're being honest, it's true also that churches are not immune to these same implicit and explicit biases or somehow the belief that leadership should only be conferred on people who are successful by the world's standards. See, I began this sermon by asking a simple question. How do you decide who belongs in your group, who should be invited to your house for a party? A lot of times we invite people who are like us, 
who look like us, talk like us, live near us, earn comparable incomes, people whose work life, faith life, and cultural life is comparable to our own. We are all a clannish people. We routinely find comfort and seek out homogeneity. And so it's not surprising when church communities throughout the country largely reflect one group, one ethnicity, one language, one economic level. Visitors may step through the doors on a Sunday morning where the sign has said all are welcome, but they will quickly get a sense of who is truly welcome when they step inside and probably have a sense of who is going to be asked to serve as a leader and who is probably not. The business model and even the church growth model use implicit biases to attract a dominant group while discouraging others. Sadly, we often prioritize whites over people of color, over non-English speakers, over those who are housing and transportation challenged, living right in our own community. And see, that's why there's so much we can learn from how the 12th disciple was chosen long ago. To our modern works righteousness way of thinking, the idea of choosing a disciple by casting lots sounds totally illogical. But remember, after Peter named the criteria, and after two names were proposed, we're told that the entire group then went to prayer. See, there was a very strong sense that God was involved in this process, an even stronger sense that whoever was chosen should be and would be a person that would honor the legacy of Christ Jesus. See, that was the foundation upon which the believers stood when they gathered together to make their choice. Let me share a quick story that illustrates this total dependence on God. I heard it long ago from a dear old South African minister, a man named Granville Morgan. Granville said that one day a father came home from work carrying this big box, and his little daughter ran out the doorway to greet him. And when she saw it, she wanted to carry the box into the house, but her father told her, well, it is much too heavy for you. But she insisted, so the man set the box down, and he asked his daughter, well, how are you going to manage to get it into the house? And clutching the box in her straining arms, the little girl said, I'll carry the box, and now you carry me. Granville would always laugh at his own stories. He would smile and say, aye, that's a lovely story, isn't it? I'll carry the box, and now you carry me. But there's a deeper truth in that story worth remembering. We're not told anything about why Joseph, Barsabbas, and Matthias were singled out from seemingly a fairly large pool of good candidates. And even after Matthias is chosen as the twelfth disciple, we never actually hear from him again. But maybe that's the point. It was never about us controlling the choosing process. It was never about us deciding Well, who is the best based on worldly criteria of education or wealth or ethnicity? It was never about us finding someone that we'd like in our group, someone that we could vouch for, someone that we would invite to a party. Now, sure, at some point, we and the disciples had to pick a plus one. But through it all, someone else was carrying us, guiding us, reminding us that there is something much bigger at stake here than just our normal, narrow human categories. By casting lots, it took the whole decision out of our biased and flawed and limited human hands, and the decision was shown to be a matter of God's unmerited grace, of God's unprejudiced acceptance, of God's amazing unconditional love. 
Now, to see if this sermon has actually truly sunk in, I want you to imagine you're seeing yourself in that crowd of 120 people around the Apostle Peter, listening as he names the criteria, and then hears as the two names are brought forth of possible candidates to be the plus one. And you hear the names, Joseph Barsabbas, and then you hear your name. You are potentially the 12th disciple the witness to Jesus Christ, the one called to embody this ministry of justice and mercy and resurrection hope. So what's your reaction to this? Do you think, oh no, I'm not worthy of this. I've not earned it. I've not studied enough. I'm not qualified. I sin. I stumble. I embarrass Jesus. I deny Christ. I fail to be whatever this position would expect me to be. But remember who is standing around you even as you make your own defense against being chosen. You're surrounded by other disciples who fled from the foot of the cross. And you're being led by a fisherman who himself denied Jesus three times. It's never been about credentials. It's never been about earning a spot. It has always been a free invitation to come to the party, to come to the banquet feast, to come be the plus one at Christ's table of grace. It was never about us. It was always about the one carrying us. Years ago, Dietrich Bonhoeffer said this, God has a future for every person which God will create through the word. So now is your time of grace and salvation. God claims you wholly and completely. So do now what God wants from you. Friends, you are the twelfth disciple. You are the plus one. So go now and live into your calling. Thanks be to God. Amen.